If you had a chance to directly impact how people saw beauty today, would you take it? Welcome back to Beauty Uncovered, sponsored by Olaplex. This week, I am talking to Anne Krishna Buena Obra. Now, she's a plus size model who has done a lot of great campaigns with big names, but also She's working behind the scenes when it comes to the marketing and how we all see beauty out in the world. Now, if you had an opportunity to really change the way the industry is, would you take it? I think I would, personally. But what I find is fascinating is that here is a new generation of women that are getting into the beauty industry that are really focused on making sure there is inclusivity, diversity in beauty, radical self-acceptance. These are all things that I definitely can get behind. So having this conversation uh, has meant so much to me and she is very exciting. I have to say, I can't wait to see the kind of waves that she's going to be making in the news in the future. With that being said, let's get started. And Krisha. All right. So right away, I want to know, how did you get your name? Because that is gorgeous. We were just saying, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so pretty. Yeah. So my parents are from the Philippines um, and Filipinos have two first names. Like mine is Anne Krisha. My sister is Ariane May. My brother is Aaron Ivan. Like, I don't know. We just have two first names. And then you take your mom's maiden name and then your dad's last name. So two first names, two last names. Um, My mom lived in Saudi Arabia for some time and she was a nurse there. And she said she she got Krisha from there. I don't really know why or how. She doesn't remember. She just knows she heard it and loved it. Um, I actually think it's Hindu. Yeah, Um, I think it is. mm -hmm. It's beautiful though. Yeah. I, I Ooh, I love that. Oh, so I you. am, we were discussing because Beauty Uncovered has always been about beauty inside and out, mm-hmm. right? It, it's that complete thing because, I mean, I've seen in my chair someone that is getting a transformation and you see everything just glow up and it's not like a, it's not just a cosmetic thing. It like it affects you on the inside, but in so many ways, there's so much more than that, which is why we try to hit like all kinds of things, mental health and emotional health and physical health and all the things. And I'm excited that we get to talk to you today because you have gotten into the beauty industry and you are speaking to true beauty, which um, is something that I wish I had when I was younger. So I'm, first of all, I want to say thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> now I have to ask, because I know that you went to um, school in college, you were international business major mm-hmm. and dance, but then you jumped into beauty and fashion and, and that whole world. What was the catalyst of that? Um, You know, honestly, when I look back at my international business degree, I think I just did it because I needed to do something, right? I come from a Filipino family and, you know, security is a big part of kind of where our paths lead us. And my parents really wanted me to be a nurse, be a doctor, do something that was really, really like undeniably secure, right? And so. I went to school and I was like, well, maybe I'll do business, right? Because they, my parents have to admit that business is a big part of how people live and make money in the United States. So it was kind of my way of just appeasing their worries for (laughs) whatever I was going to do in school. But I genuinely didn't really know what I, how I was going to, you know, end up with that degree or like what was going to happen. I danced because I love dancing, but I've always just loved fashion and beauty since I was in high school. I used to sew my own clothes Mm. and I just, and I would play with my mom's like Mary Kay and all of that stuff. So, you know, the degree didn't, wasn't anything except just a cover up for what I really wanted to do, I guess. So right when I graduated, I always knew I wanted to be in fashion or beauty. 
Um, but international beauty is not exactly like an easy course that you just kind of coasting by. That, yes. that must have been hard. No, yeah, it was. And I will say it did help set me up for success within the fashion and beauty industry mm-hmm. because 95% of this industry is business. That yeah. 5% of creativity fuels it. But honestly, that 95% is what makes it happen every single day. But yet you use so much of your uh, creativity in your work. I mean, Mm -hmm. yes, business is a huge part of it. And I I know that even on my side, but still your your voice, uh, even right down to your body and in modeling, Mm -hmm. all of that is an aspect of creativity. I've seen some of your writing. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, when you've gotten into the beauty industry, I mean, obviously we all know that for the most part, there is a societal standard that's out there, right? I mean, for years and years, when I was younger, um, I always knew I was never going to achieve that standard. (laughs) So, I mean, for a lot of us, we felt subpar, like we weren't enough. Um, I'm grateful that as I got older, I recognized that it was more than that. But I still saw it in the industry that a lot of people were not looking at that true beauty. What was your experience with it? And what made you kind of go into the industry with your own unique voice? Um, I, For me, I, I similar to you. For so much of my life, I always felt like I was trying to reach that standard that we're constantly Mm -hmm. being fed, right? And I think there was just a point in my life where I was like, I will never be that because it was not made for me. It was not made in my consideration. And for a lot of people, it wasn't made for us to be. And I realized like what I really yearn for is within beauty is self-acceptance right? Like I just want to feel beautiful, but there are so many caveats to how it, what it meant to feel beautiful. And I was just tired of it. I was just tired of it. To you, what would you be considering as the definition of true beauty? I believe true beauty is ownership. Mm. It's ownership of self, of who you are, what you've done, who you will become. Um, and yeah, living in full, full acceptance of, of you, um, owning the face that you have, the body that you have, and just celebrating it exactly how it is, not trying to manipulate it, but trying to care for it, right? Not trying to shape shift and adorn it in ways that are, you know, appealing to everybody else, but really just for you because it's yours. And and with that ownership. It's also accepting the fact that you can be celebrating the body that you're in and still want to improve or exactly. work on it. It's and that's acceptable. It's not a shame. That is a big thing that I've actually been working on um, you know, over the last couple of years is how those two can exist together, right? That's a hard one to wrap your brain around. I'm not gonna lie. Because I've had the same issue. Because we're used to want improvement stemming from discomfort and stemming from like, you know, we don't like what we see. We are trying to change it. And what I've learned over the last couple of years and how to reframe it so that I still live in acceptance and ownership of myself is like all of those, you know, the ways that I want to improve or change or just, you know, better myself. Actually, I wouldn't even say improve or better, but just honor myself more. Like there are places we just want to honor ourselves more. And it's not that we're doing a bad job. It's just that we now see we deserve more of that. Like, or or even just actualizing what we see in our head, what we feel mm-hmm. in our heart and what really resonates with us as a human. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I gotta be honest with you. I'm not a natural blonde. <laughs> so I'm That's thinking great. if I was to embrace my natural beauty, it would not be this color right now. But I, it is a struggle because like, even when I was younger, it had a lot to do with my weight because I was always, you know, the roly poly kid, this, that, and that. And it was always a struggle to embrace who I was, but still wanted to change everything. Yeah. But now as I'm older and we were talking about this before I pressed record, um, I was kidding around about how, oh, I'm going to go get Botox. Now, 
there's this part of me that wants to embrace the fact that I'm aging. Cause let me tell you, I have earned every last bit of this age. Yeah. I have worked it. <laughs> It is wonderful. I actually love this age better than any time in my life, but I don't want the wrinkles. So yeah, I'm going to get Botox. And it's very hard to explain to people that one is not mutually exclusive mm -hmm. from the other. Yeah. And that's also a part of ownership, owning the parts and aspects of you that do want a little bit more, that mm -hmm. do want to see something different. Or have, you know, have a say in, in your, in your beauty too. That's a big part of it. I think, you know, I say ownership because not everyone wants to just be hundred percent natural, you know, and that's okay too. Um, I think you just have to be comfortable with yourself at the end of the day and not hate yourself. Right. Like something I tell myself is, you know, I want to love myself to healthy, right? Not hate myself too skinny or too fit or too whatever it might be. Um, and it just, it really does look different for everybody. Um, I'm, you know, getting into my thirties later this year. And so the Botox conversation comes up a lot more. And when I was younger, I used to think like, oh my God, no, like that's for people who. That's are, how I used to think. Taboo. And then people would try to be like, oh, no, it's preventative. But I'm like, now I'm like, if you want to get it, just get it. You know, it's your prerogative. If it makes you feel good, do it. It doesn't mean you're deeply uncomfortable with yourself. It just means you want a little help in the place that is important to you. Isn't it so strange, though? Like, you know, when we're looking at ourselves and we're making decisions for ourselves, we're worrying about what other people are thinking. And yet if we're not doing right for ourselves and we're not accepting ourselves, they're still judging. So it's like, there is a catch to it. Like you can't escape that cycle. So at some point or another, you just got to shut it all off. Yeah. 100%. And at the end of the day, you just have to accept yourself because there's always going to be something wrong that you do. So now a lot of people talk about radical self-acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. I've heard this said many times, but what would you say is your definition of it? Because like, it's always very like this vague notion. It sounds really cool, but I'm not entirely sure what that involves. Yeah. I love this question. Um, for me, radical self-acceptance feels like freedom. Mm. It's freedom from thoughts that might maybe weigh you down or haunt you. It's freedom from critic self-criticism that, you know, kind of plague your days. I used to walk around constantly criticizing myself. Like I would walk, look at my reflection in the mirror and just start picking. And that's not freedom. You know, that doesn't feel light. I think rad radical self-acceptance should, you should have you feeling free and light. And, you know, if that means getting Botox for yourself or whatever it might be without your own self-judgment or the care of what other people say around you, and that makes you feel free and light, then you've accepted yourself. It's very um, hard because we all have that generational curse. Unfortunately, yeah. and, and I'm not saying I'm trying to bl blame my mother or anything like that. <laughs> But I'm saying it unfortunately is generational. I mean, it, it's something that's been passed on forever. It is. And that's why the weight is heavy. That's yeah. why the judgment is heavy and it lingers and it's so hard to get rid of. And that's why the idea of radical self-acceptance feels like esoteric. Like it feels like, what does that even mean? Because all of those years and years of, you know, judgment that's been passed on and of, of, you know, everyone who came before us weighs on our shoulders. So we don't even know what it looks like to be free. So just, let me ask you something. Do you think that social media has made it easier for like radical self-acceptance only because I feel like more people are just putting themselves out there and saying, this is who I am? Or do you think it's more difficult because for every person that's putting it out there, there's some troll going on there saying something and you have to be able to put blinders on. Mm -hmm, 100%. Um, that's a really great one. And there's two sides to that answer. I think on one hand, um, from a creation perspective, there has social media has made it a lot easier for self-acceptance and for stories of self-acceptance to be shown, to be shared, to be created. 
and to be consumed, right? And that is opening up a whole other space for people to feel good about themselves when they're seeing all these different creators and sorts of people just gain recognition and be seen. Um, on the other hand, like you said, there's always it also leaves room for people to really, really be able to shut mm. that down as well. I think we, you know, social media is always just a mirror of us. And so as much as like we can we have that space to honor like the braveness and all of that of those who are sharing their story, like we still as individuals have to have our strength and have to have the discernment to like know what to block and push away mm. and know what to let in. Um, it's so- very hard though, because like, I know a lot of people that are so great. They will shut it down. They'll block, they'll move on me. I, I admittedly, anytime I see like a negative comment, I'm tend to kind of think that's a person hurting. I should speak to them, <laughs> even though they're saying something horrible to me, but it, it never turns out. Okay. Like yeah. I should just block them. Yeah. Get it out of my psyche. I don't have to be responsible for their issues. I was going to say, yeah, a lot of the time it hurts because we're internalizing it or taking it very personal or, you know, maybe we, maybe we put something up for validation and we didn't get it. So now we're in pain, but anytime you're using social to validate yourself, you're setting yourself up for definitely hurt. So you have worked with some of biggest brands in beauty, the biggest brands. Do you feel that you've been able to kind of, whether they, they hired you on because of your perspective on beauty, or do you think it's that you were hired and you've kind of like wiggled it in, (laughs) which if you have, I appreciate it. Yes. I think it's, it's a combination of both. Um, my favorite thing is wiggling these things in, right? Like you feel like you're pulling one over on somebody. It's kind of fun. Yes, totally. Like being hired for, you know, the strategy for the knowledge, but then steering them towards this direction of, well, this is how it's going to happen. And this is, these are the stories that you have to tell. And this is the diversity that you have to truly not just not display, I won't say that, but the diversity that you have to embody if you actually have it. If you don't, take a look at yourself. But it's it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to hold a mirror up to some of these really big brands and show them like, this is where everyone's going and here's where you need to catch up. Otherwise, you're about to get left behind. It is interesting because I definitely have seen over the past, I want to say five years, a, a, a big shift in um, certainly in diversity, mm-hmm. but I I have to admit I'm still a little disappointed that they haven't gotten onto the body inclusivity. Like mm-hmm. some have, some have completely gone on board and bravo to them. I will shop with them um, because in my opinion, I want to see it all. Um, whether I'm shopping for myself or I'm shopping for my girlfriend, um, she's, you know, a size 24 not the size same as same as me, but we'll sometimes look at the same clothing. You know, she's um, you know, I've known her since we were 13 years old. We we have a lot of the same style. So, you know, we kind of look at it, that stuff and to not have representation on there, it's a lot harder for her to figure out whether or not that's going to be appropriate. I 100 percent agree with you. I actually just came from New York Fashion Week. And mm. my the biggest thing for me and a lot of the people that I was there with watching the shows were all like, what is going on with the diversity on the runway? And sure, maybe those designers didn't make those clothes for me or anyone else above a size, you know, four. But then what's the point of making those clothes? Or what's the point of wanting, you know, being a brand that wants to sell to people when you're selling to such a small group. Um, And I don't know, they might say it's the art, it's this, it's that. But then there's a part of me that's like, well, I think. So why isn't a plus size art? Yeah. Why isn't plus size? Why can't they be the muse? Yes, exactly. And if that's your art, 
all well and fine, but I also feel like we need to stop putting such an emphasis and so much praise around, you know, these clothes and these fashions that are really only meant for a small group of people. And it could still be their art and it could still be their, you know, whatever they want it to be. I'm not saying we have to force people to be inclusive if the designer or the no, brand. No, but I mean, it, not the brand. look, if you have watched anything in the month of September, mm-hmm. right? We're airing this in October. I'm saying if you've watched anything in the month of September, you saw Lizzo looking like a piece of art. Literally. Like yeah. a gorgeous, like, I know there were some people that criticized it because it was so voluminous, but I'm sorry. I was, was living gorgeous. for it. I don't care gorgeous. what size you were. She was stunning. Yes. Stunning. 100%. So how difficult is it? It's not. That's Exactly. It's super not difficult. And I think my perspective is, you know what? Fashion, do what you want to do. But we need, I think as a broader society, it's just like, there's no need to praise or be excited or think so highly about brands or designers who aren't doing good work in inclusivity or anything else, because at the end of the day, they're Mm self-interested, but we're feeding that self-interest. And then we're asking, why are we not being represented? But we're turning to the wrong people or looking to people who don't think about us in that way at all. Even in uh, some of the beauty brands that are makeup or whatever, they some of the same issues. I think some are getting a lot better too. They're they're starting to show, I guess you would say, a broad spectrum of people. Yes, uh-huh. um, from whether it be age, size, ethnicity, um, sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. I feel like they're starting to be a lot more inclusive, at least in that. Or am I wrong? Or am I not seeing it right? You are right. That is why I gravitate towards beauty so much more. Yeah. Is because they show that range a lot more. And it's not showing range to check boxes, which I think fashion does a lot as a model. When I've worked with clothing brands, athletic wear, um, you know, it's I'm always hired as a size. Right. But for beauty, I'm hired as a person, as a look, as part of a larger story that they're telling, showing like beauty <laughs> exists, you know, in so many different places. So that is why I do gravity towards beauty. And you're totally right. They're tapping into diversity and inclusion in the right way, which is not by checking off boxes, not token tokenizing, you know, okay, we need this kind of person, this kind of person, but genuinely looking at models or whoever they talent they might hire and putting together a story based on kind of, you know, what they're seeing and the different looks. So that's where I'm I'm I feel like you're leading me everywhere I want to go on this conversation. <laughs> you know, Krishna, I love it. Um, because I want to talk about storytelling because wow. In beauty, you know, yes, we can see the results of anything, whether it be makeup, hair, um, clothing, but in the long run, it's about making those emotional touch points, right? And I'm finding more and more, especially on like social media and whatnot, um, there's more storytelling going on. Something I feel like sometimes I got to work on uh, because I tend to be like, a lot of my listeners know I do hair facts from a professional mm-hmm. and I just like to give facts and, and help to give basic information. But yeah, sometimes you got to get into that storytelling to draw them emotionally. Yes. How do you do that in beauty? Yeah. Um, in beauty, it's about personability and personalization. You Mm -hmm. can't speak to everybody because you don't know everybody. You can't represent, you can't represent everything because like, even for me as a Filipina, like I never feel or say that I'm representing all Filipinas or I'm doing this for the Filipinos because I'm not all of them. And I don't even look like most of them or have the same experiences. So I can only really say I'm doing it for me. And those emotional touch points are created through your own personalization of your content and just sharing your point of view. That's really where it is. And if you share your point of view and people happen to connect with it, that's amazing. That's all we can ask for. But I think when it comes to storytelling and personability, 
it can't be strategic too strategic. Otherwise it comes off inauthentic. Yeah. No, I I've noticed that. I think, uh, Sometimes there's a very fine line between the sales pitch mm-hmm. and and really just speaking from the heart of what your experience is. You totally, know, totally. Um, do you find that there's even like a shift with that? Because I find a lot of times I'm watching people and they're hardcore giving those um, sales points. You know, they're giving that. Uh, what do they call them? See, I'm so good at this stuff that I know exactly what the the phrase is. It's when they they it's give that pitch. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they they're supposed to create their content, this and that, and then they're they're told by whatever brand, you know, we want you to pitch this, and they have to pitch mm-hmm. it, and then it just ruins the story. Yeah. And it really is kind of taking away their social equity, isn't it? Yep. One hundred percent. And when I work with brands. You know, I always tell them, you know, I understand that you are meeting specific goals, whether it's for marketing or sales, but the way that things are set up now, especially in social media, is that people can see right through everything. If the core of what you're doing is trying to sell them something and you're trying to wrap it in something, you know, pretty or intimate or emotional, they can tell. So you always have to lead with the emotion or lead with the story and then let your product or whatever it might be, be ancillary to it. And I used to work at brands before, you know, working with them. So I know that every brand has a mission, a vision and values. That is something you can easily personify and put at the center of all your work because it's still conducive to who you are as a brand, but it's not always centering, you know, this ulterior motive, which is selling stuff. And, mm-hmm. No, I and completely agree. 100%. And I think with creators too, and influencers too, the ones who do the best are really the ones who are being themselves. The ones who are a little bit more contrived and too polished or, you know, too curated, you know, that hasn't done as well anymore. Those are, those are techniques and styles of days past and social media and the internet has evolved so much that we just can see right through anything and everything. Let me tell you, you know, in the hair industry, you know, uh, the professional hair community, we used to have like an old saying where, you know, a hairdresser always knows when they're being sold to. Mm-hmm. They always know when they're being pitched um, and and when they feel like it's coming from a subversive way or a, an unexpected way like that, they don't appreciate it. So now it's it's becoming a little bit like that now. It's it's different. But I have to say, though. As a person that like if I follow someone and I respect them, I mean, it's not any different than me Googling to find out like what's the best um website for whatever app and and they're giving me a breakdown of you know what they think now they might have an affiliate link but that whatever they just explained to me why that's their favorite and because i respect them and they want high quality i know i want to go with them yeah that's also something i'm seeing a lot a lot of people jumping from brand to brand and then that's like is it the highest paycheck or is it because you really do really <laughs> love the product. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, as for individuals, you know, they also have to constantly reinforce trust mm. with their audience. And I think something that's, you know, might be hard, at least at the beginning, is when you've built that trust because you're genuinely doing things on your own. And then the offers start coming in. And they look good, you know, they look good. And I totally get it that it can be, how do you balance those two? It's things? really hard to balance. That's hard, yeah. Because even on my pages, I, I mean, I don't know how Olaplex feels about it, but like I talk about hair, I try not to mention Olaplex because I don't want to abuse their trust. However, someone directly asked me like, hey, how do I do this? <laughs> and I'm like, all right, look, full disclosure, I work for them, but let me explain. Okay, let's dive in. <laughs> but you know, sorry. Yeah. You mentioning disclosure, that is actually one of the biggest and best ways to continue your trust as you grow and as you get bigger and bigger as an individual, as an expert, as an influencer, creator, whatever it might be, 
Um, I've seen that work really, really well for some big creators um, within fashion and with beauty of just disclosing, like, I got this as a gift. I was asked to review this. I, you know, and just being really honest about things. Yeah. I mean, I always give full disclosure, but I also sit there and say, um, I literally pursued the job six years ago. I was a hairdresser. And as soon as I tried it, I was like, I must work for them. So <laughs> I mean, okay. so I mean, I, I, I'm a fan. So, but I mean, I, I do feel that weird balance of wanting to make sure that I'm not abusing anyone's trust and making them feel like they're coming on for a commercial. No, you're not. I'm here because I want to help you. You yeah. know, um, sometimes that includes Olaplex. So <laughs> exactly. Yes. It's a hard balance, lady. <laughs> oh, mm. it, it is a really, really hard balance. I want to circle back actually to something you were saying, and it, I, you know, of course I go down the merry squirrel way, but you know, <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit also. I, I know that you, you were mentioning you were Filipino, but there is a big rise in the Filipino beauty brands right now. I mean, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? It's very exciting to watch. Oh my gosh. It is so exciting for me because I grew up going home to the Philippines every other year. And I remember the last time I went, which is 2018. Wow. Um, and I was already working in the beauty industry um, and I hadn't been you know, home for a while. So I was like, I want to scope out the scene. And I was really surprised with how many local brands there were, but I was also surprised with how many or how much the beauty industry hadn't changed since I was younger. Wow. And in the Philippines, it's, you know, it's very honestly, it's colonized beauty. The standards are, you know, straight, straight hair, which for the most part, isn't even natural to the Philippines. We're an Island, you know, we're Islanders. Um, but anyone who has, you know, naturally straight hair, that's Filipino. There's typically like some colonization <laughs> that happened. Yeah. Um, and then really light skin. So very, very, um, light people like to bleach their skin. And so, yeah. And again, not endemic to Filipinos. Like we're an island, we're an archipelago. So when I came back, I was surprised that that was still, that's still what it was. People still wanted the jet black straight hair and the light skin. And they actually, a lot of the beauty trends um, take, or a lot of the beauty trends are informed by East Asian beauty trends. And so for me, I was like, oh, we need our own things. Like, ownership again you know always back to ownership like we what's what is what are what's the beauty that we want to embody that we've always had and always embodied right so now seeing brands you know like sunny's face come to the us so exciting also some new brands pop up like multi is a great new filipino founded brand that i'm really into it's exciting because it's showing ownership like it's showing like okay we're going to do our own thing. We're going to do what we want to do. Um, and that's like, uh, that makes me so happy. It makes me want to like go back home to the Philippines and see what else is new or what else is there. But, but yeah, I love it. And I love seeing a lot of, um, Filipinas in the beauty industry too, whether they're creators, editors, founders, there's just so much more of us. And it's, it's really exciting. So do you find yourself I mean, considering the vast experience you have, I mean, it's so multifaceted and also that business degree. <laughs> Do you ever think about starting your own brand? Because I sit there and listen to someone that's in the industry trying to live as authentically as they can and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Like that's something people want to get behind. Here, I'm trying to convince you to make your own <laughs> brand. I <laughs> Oh my gosh. I mean, it would be fascinating. You know, I have thought about that and I've actually been told this. I think for me, if I were to start a brand, I definitely would want to fill a specific mission or white space, right? Like mm -hmm. I look at, you know, like Selena Gomez who made Rare Beauty um, for makeup that was friendly to her lupus as, as, you know, um, for her and like 
Amy Liu from Tower 28, who made amazing, sensitive skin, eczema friendly, all eczema certified, you know, makeup, which I use because I get eczema and it's just like, oh, we needed this. And I would want to, you know, follow in those footsteps of really filling a white space or at least something, you know, for that feels good to me. Um, I think a lot of brands pop up now as like vanity projects or just cash cows could never be me, could never be me. So I'm super open to having my own brand. I think, you know, I'll, when the inspo or the message or the mission comes, I will totally take it on. <laughs> We're going to put this out in the universe. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm telling you, we have to put this out in the universe because um, I, I think we need more people like you in the industry. Oh, and thank you. sincerely, I think we need more people like you that are, that have that broad mind that can uh, look at everything and really see where they can help. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for thank coming you. on today. This was such a phenomenal conversation. I loved it. I know. I feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.